All right. As I mentioned right before we went on, I am recording this. And one thing I say at the beginning of all of these webinars is watch this again. You may be familiar with the broken wing butterfly. You may have seen it online, things of that nature. But I have some rules that I want you guys to follow in order to increase your probabilities of success. You can do this in just about any stock. But if you're following my rules, it doesn't work all the time. So I'm going to give you guys some set guidelines to follow through. Uh, these different steps in order to set this up. If it doesn't work out, move on to another strategy around that particular underlying. There's all kinds of strategies I teach that will work in high implied volatility, like for instance, what we're gonna be using with this one, that will work in and around that underlying. But if you're looking to do a non-directional trade, this is one of them but it does not work for every single underlying uh, all the time. I mean, it will work for every single underlying, but not every single time you look at it. How's that sound, all right? Uh, so you just have to pick and choose when you're able to put this one on. And like I mentioned, this is the broken wing butterfly. We did the broken wing call butterfly the last time. This time we're gonna be looking at the put butterfly, but let me get a couple of things out of the way real quick. My name's Eric Wilkinson, and you guys may recognize me from CNBC, Fox Business, or Wall Street Journal for my commentary on everything from economic to geopolitical and market analysis. I started trading in college uh, with a psychology degree and some money I had earned, and then decided to switch it over to finance uh, after about a year. After graduating college with a finance degree, moved up to Chicago and uh, started out as a runner sold all my stocks and everything else, bought myself one of the cheapest badges I could on the floor because uh, that's what was getting me into the pit. Uh, and in that time, I've traded everything from stocks, financial futures, commodities, currencies, and options on all these products, basically in all market conditions. Uh, I got to go over this disclaimer real quick. Any opinions, news, research, and analysis, or other information contained here does not constitute investment advice or solicitation to buy or sell any of these securities or strategies. Actually, I'm gonna even be talking about strat or stocks uh, or underlyings that are in my portfolio. And no, I'm not trying to get you guys to do the same thing I'm doing. What I'm trying to do is teach you ways to implement options into your portfolio or into your trading regimen, all right? But it's up to you to make your own decisions and do your own homework. Please remember the past performance of any trading system or methodology is not necessarily indicative of future results. Uh, can you uh, repeat what you said about this strategy? Thanks. Um, it's the broken wing butterfly. And basically uh, what we're talking, let me get this out of the way real quick. And I, I'm probably going to repeat it here. You guys can follow me on Wolf uh, at Wolfman's blog or follow our parent company at Pro Trader Strat. Um, basically what the, the broken wing butterfly is, is it's a long butterfly. And then when you break one wing and you kind of skip a strike, <clears throat> By selling, synthetically selling a uh, put spread inside of this butterfly finances the whole thing in a sense. Okay, so we're kind of, we're doing a long butterfly. We're breaking the wing. It's still a long put butterfly, but because we sell that short put spread in there, and I'm going to show you how how that all works out. We're selling an embedded short put spread in there, and that finances this whole rigmarole. All right. So uh, one thing you can note is that it's also called a skip strike butterfly or wounded wing butterfly. I've heard those terms before. I will always call it a broken wing butterfly. It's just uh, the way I learned it. And that's the way I think about it. All right. Uh, it's a market neutral strategy. All right. That's being said, really important. Just like it, another butterfly, we want, or the long butterfly, we want this to be um, market neutral, okay? We don't want this to move a whole lot. We are going to sell this synthetic put spread inside of this uh, long butterfly in order to get rid of all risk to the upside, okay? And that is extremely important when you're setting up this strategy is you have to eliminate one side's risk because you're taking on more risk on the other side of the strategy. So if we're gonna be taking on more risk, we need to have a higher probability of profit. And in order to do this as a higher probability of profit, we need to do this strategy for 
zero outlay of money, which means we aren't paying a debit or we receive a credit. OK, so the worst we can do this for is no exchange of money in a sense, other than the commissions, of course. But, you know, a zero credit or a credit. Don't ever set this strategy up and have it be a debit because you've increased your probability or you've increased your risk on one side and you really haven't increased your probabilities of success if you do it for a debit because you still have risk in both directions. And we're trying to eliminate some of the directionality. All right, some of the advantages of the rook wing butterfly uh, are that you can collect a credit or do it for free. The stock can rally and you can still make money. But like I said, don't ever do this for a debit because the risks then outweigh the reward. All right, we have to have a market assumption. That market assumption has to be neutral. If you are bearish in this underlying, do not put this on. OK, it is a put and it seems like it should want to go down, but we do not want this to go down. We only want it to go up and we must have impl uh, implied volatility percent above 50. I'm going to talk about implied volatility percent till I'm about blue in the face, you guys. So if you don't understand what I'm talking about here, you will by the end of it. I can almost assure you and collect a credit or do it for zero dollars outlay. All right. How do we set this thing up? What we're doing is we're buying, you know, if you go online, they're going to say buy the in the money put. I like to go as close to at the money as I can. And that gives me a little wiggle room to the upside. All right. I'm not trying to nail the number right where it's trading right now. I'm trying to give it a little bit of wiggle room to the upside uh, in order to achieve a max profit potential. All right. And that also gives me by doing that a little bit uh more comfort zone, especially in a bull market like we're kind of seeing right now. All right, keys to success, picking the right environment. I mentioned this once or twice already. We want higher implied volatility percent. It's not just vol, you guys. Every stock has its own volatility. Some stocks will have a 50 volatility. Some stocks will generally have like, uh, you know, a 25 or 30 volatility, all right? ETFs are usually way down around 15-ish, uh, okay? And, and some of them will even go lower than that. But we need to pick the right environment. That means when that underlines implied volatility for itself is in the upper range, upper extreme range, that's when we want to do this. And what I mean by that is, uh, let me pull up a, chart real quick. All right. This is Procter and Gamble and this is the implied volatility at the bottom. And this is just implied volatility for Procter and Gamble. All right. You can see it looks just like a chart. It goes up and down. It always really wants to migrate right back to the mean, whether that's the support or the resistance, but pretty much the mid area. Now to figure out implied volatility percent for this particular underline, you have a numerator and a denominator. Okay. In this division table. In the numerator, we take the current implied volatility right here. We're going to round these up two decimal places and make it a percent. So 18. So you take 18 and subtract that by uh, subtract 11 out of that. So we have seven in the numerator. That sum then divided by what's in the denominator. And that is the high minus the low. So the high is uh, 25 and the low is still 11. So 14. So seven divided by 14 is 50. So Procter and Gamble is at an uh, implied volatility percent of 50. Okay. Does that make sense for everybody? This was one of the cleaner examples I've ever had. Uh, 18 in the numerator minus the low, which is 11. So that's seven. That sum is seven. Divide that by the high minus the low, which is 14. 7 divided by 14 is 50. This is in the 50% range, okay? Now, you can see right now Procter & Gamble is 18, and we could look at something like Tesla, and Tesla's at 60. But we could probably look at Tesla even further and say that it's pretty close to the implied volatility percent of 50, maybe a shade higher. But you see, every underlying has its own implied volatility and therefore 
what we're trying to find out is if implied volatility right now for this underlying is high in respect to where it's been in the past. And the only reason why we're looking at where it's been in the past necessarily is because every underlying has its own implied volatility and will have its extremes in a sense, okay? Like you're probably not going to often see Tesla go into the teens on implied volatility percent. It's just tech stocks don't usually do that. I mean, one could argue that Tesla is not a tech stock, but um, and it really isn't, but it, it kind of falls within all of that in a sense. You know, I know it's a car automaker, but um, you get my gift. All right, so the next one. So we got our environment, high implied volatility, above 50, picking the right underlying. All that means, you guys, is that we want tight markets, right? If we're looking at a market in an underlying that's under $100, we need the bid ask to be 10 cents wide. All right, because the wider the spread, the wider the spread of each of these uh, strikes is, that means you have to give up all this edge to get in and all this edge to get out. And yeah, there are stocks out there that are very popular and, and traded on the stock exchange, you know, millions of times a day. Those stocks don't always correlate to the options. You know, something like Apple and uh, Amazon and those kind of stocks will. But let's say like Aon or uh, AutoZone is always the first one that comes to my mind because everybody's seen AutoZones around. But that stock, AutoZone's traded a lot on the exchange, but there's nobody interested in trading the options. OK, so we need a lot of uh, volume and open interest. This doesn't seem like a lot of volume and open interest, but it was a pretty quiet day. Therefore, we're looking for the bid ask as long as these are all within uh, with 35 days to expiration, you know, somewhere the spot month, which is what I would call it. This is not the spot month anymore. It's probably rolled out to the August. So the spot month, which is the most traded contract, make sure that the bid offer is inside of 10 cents. Of course, if you go way out here, that's not going to generally be the rule. This one happens to uh, find that rule, but a lot of stocks won't always have that tight of markets that far out. OK, so tight bid ask. On a stock under $100, we want 10 cents wide. If the stock's over $100, for instance, uh, let's look at Adobe or something, uh, it's two, $250. Move the decimal three ticks to the left. 25 cents wide is how wide the bid ask should be then, okay? So under $100, 10 cents wide. Over $100, move the decimal three ticks to the left, and that's how wide your market should be. That should show a very uh, well-traded underlying, um, okay? So stick with that rule there. Make sure they're tight markets. Move the decimal three ticks to the left on any stock over $100, pretty simple. All right, picking the right duration. With this one, you know, we want to have high implied volatility and we want less than 35 days to expiration. Remember, we're trying to nail this number so we don't want to go too far out in time. Uh, and with butterflies and those at the money options, they decay slower than the out of the money options, which makes a lot of sense. But having said that, we want that theta to decay. We want this options, we want these options to decay quickly so we can get out sooner. All right. So 35 days to expiration to accelerate that uh, decay in those options we're trading. You go further out, you know, this is one of the lower probability strategies sometimes, um, you know, just because it's a butterfly. We've increased the probabilities of success. It's probably going to be 70 percent probability of success or higher, slightly higher. I want to I'm trying to do the math in my head while I'm talking. Um, but having said that, we want shorter duration so that theta decay is maximized. Right. And I'll show you on a chart here. These are the at the money calls and puts and the theta decay. You can see further out in duration that theta coming out of those options premium isn't that much. You know, this is the options pricing or the price of those options. You can see that the premium is not coming out until we get inside that 35 days to expiration. And then we get a 50 percent drop uh, in the next. What is that? 28 days. 
Okay, so 50% drop in premium in the next 28 days, and that's what we're looking at. We want to stay out of this little area here. There's a lot of stuff that goes on inside the last 10 days to expiration that I don't want to be a part of for a strategy like this. If you're watching me on the daily market commentaries where I've been talking uh, daily about all my trades, you saw I did a gamma trade, and this is this is the area for trading gamma and uh, played around with that trade uh, last couple of days. That's specific to that kind of environment. On this one, when I'm 35 days out, I wanna stay away from that because I've set up my strategy uh, ahead of time. I don't wanna be messing around in there. You know, Big money starts coming in there and trying to pin the price to what they want. And I can assure you, they're probably gonna do a better job at pinning that price than you will be able to, all right? Picking the right strikes. This goes back to making sure we get this for a credit or no money paid out, right? We definitely want a credit. Don't ever do this for a debit. If you take anything away from this broken wing butterfly thing, don't do it for a debit, right? Um, so picking the right strikes. What we're gonna be doing here is starting with those at the monies. That's the way I like to do it. It seems to be the easiest way to get it done, to set it up for a credit. So I set it up where on this one, um, I'm gonna have a little bit of wiggle room uh, on the downside. I think I set it to the upside. I was thinking calls the last time, but I'm gonna give myself a little bit of wiggle room to the downside to be correct. Um, all right, so, some of the difference, oh, sorry, let me, I skipped one, sorry. And knowing your exit strategy before ending in the trade, and this is one thing I go back to my notes here on the desk. Every time you do a trade, you guys, write it down. Write what was going on in your head to put you into this trade, okay? That is good data to go back because, you know, months later when you're going back and trying to check out what went wrong and what your strategies weren't, why some of your strategies weren't working and things of that nature, that will bring you back to where you were when you put that trade on. Also, write down where you're getting out, the exact price or the loss or the profit or the loss where you're going to get out. Know that before you enter and you will be much better off. You will follow those rules. You will follow that. You will get out when you said you're gonna get out if you write it down. If it's in your head, everybody does it. I've seen it hundreds of times on the floor that a guy says, I'm going to get out at a certain price. It doesn't get out there. You ask him, why didn't you get out there? And he's like, oh, I'm going to milk it for a couple more ticks. And then the next thing you know, Pfft. all right, it went against him, you know, or he lost money. And that's the worst feeling in the world. Don't let that happen. If you told yourself you're getting out there, get out and don't look back. Don't ever think about leaving money on the table. The bottom line is you took money off the table and you didn't have more risk, all right? That's what you need to do when you're trading options. Take the money off the table. You don't have that risk anymore. You're not worried about it. If you go back and see that it's kind of continue on, go out there and look for another high probability strategy to put around that underlying, but follow your, uh, your mandate of getting in and out, all right? So the traditional butterfly, we've got to nail the number. It, it does come with lower margin requirements though, all right? It's a tighter spread uh, and it's gonna have lower margin requirements. But when we break that wing, we transfer the risk, all right? We transfer it from the upside where we had risk to the downside. And by doing, by transferring that risk, it's from selling that synthetic put spread, okay? And I'm gonna talk about it here in a minute, I see some people asking. I will talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but we have a higher profit potential. And a anytime you have a higher profit potential, anytime your prob probability of profit is higher, then you are going to have a higher max loss. That's the risk reward, right? All right. But you're protected from an upward move, right? And I don't know why I have that chart. <laughs> so traditional versus the broken wing. This is the traditional analyze tab for the broken wing. Philip Morris here is our example. And Philip Morris was trading um, right around 85. I think it was uh, trading 83.39 uh, right here. So that's where it was. So I gave myself a little bit of wiggle room to the downside. Uh, 
when I would set this up, but I've got to get my max profit. I got to nail that number landing right there on that 82 and a half uh, at expiration, which I would never do. Um, but you're paying a 39 cent debit for that. So you limited your risk to the downside. Now, let's say we break the wing. When we break this wing, what we're doing is, you can see these are all equal distance, $2.50 wide. What we're doing is we're selling the 80 put and then buying a uh, 77 and a half put. So that gives us a $5 wide and then a $2.50 wide. So let's see what happens when we do that. There you go. We sold the 80 put. We bought in the 75 put. That's that synthetic short put spread that we embedded in there. See, that's we sold out those 80s and then bought the 77 and a half. That's the short put spread that finances uh, the upside, gives us the wiggle room. Yes, we did transfer some risk uh, to the downside, but we are more bullish, but I gave myself a little bit of wiggle room to the downside, so that makes us good. And we do it for 11 cent credit. So that's where we have no risk to the upside, right? Even after your commissions, you have no risk to the upside, right? And then this would be the uh, profit and loss and all of that stuff. So your max profit would be $261 on a one lot. Your buying power effect is uh, $239, okay? So a couple of things here, and uh, I'll jump into the screen platform. Uh, profit target. We're looking at getting 50% of our max profit. So in this situation, when we were looking at it, our max profit is when the underlying lands right here. Okay. So that's our $2.50 wide spread. We're looking to take 50% of that, $1.25. Get in and get out. I mean, getting a dollar for an option strategy is a nice win at, on any given day if you had a dollar max or a dollar profit in an option strategy. So don't go for the full thing. Get out at about half of what your max profit potential. What is the max profit potential? It's the higher strike minus the middle strike plus the net credit. Basically, it's the, the width of your regular spread not the one with the embedded one in there. So in our case, we were looking at a $2.50 wide. We are looking at a $2.50 wide spread right here. It's the higher strike minus the lower strike, $2.50 plus that 11 cents. So 261 is our max profit, all right? Our max loss. What do you think a max loss is gonna be? It's not going to be it's the skip strike minus the lower strike. So it's still only that $2.50 minus the next the net credit. So now we're at $2.39 is our max loss. So our max profit is higher than our max loss in this situation. All right. And how does that work out? Well, what happens is, let me pull up, let me just use this one. Uh, what happens is as the market goes down. Okay, so our, you know, this looks like it's a $5 wide. It looks like, wow, I could lose $5 on this. No, or actually right here, $5 wide. I should lose $5 on this side when we're only losing $2, less than $2.50. Well, it's because you've made, if, the, if you're directionally wrong, the market goes down, this spread is max profit. So you've made $2.50 on this upper spread and that gets your break even $2.50 to the downside. Does that make sense? This spread is worth $2.50. That pays for us all the way down to 80 on no risk, all right? So that's why it's the skip strike minus the lower strike. It's the skip strike, the 80, minus the seven and a half, two dollars and fifty cents because this finance the synthetic uh embedded put spread you don't see anymore. Okay, so that financed the upper one, right? Which is the skip strike minus the credit is the break even, which is kind of what I explained there as well. All right. So skip strike minus the credit, which is that eleven cents uh 
is where your break even is. So it's right, right around that 80 strikes. So 79, 89 is your break even. All right, so this is the part of the webinar where I throw it out to you guys to throw in some stocks that we can look at and uh, set it up for this strategy. Since I've got Adobe up right now, let's just look at it. Implied volatility percent is way too low. I have it set up here. Um, if you don't have the script for it, uh, we give that out to our uh, premium members. But 32 IV, it's way too low. We're not going to get the bang for our buck. Now, what this tells us we don't want the premiums to go up in this strategy. We want the premiums to come out of it. So that's why when premiums are inflated with high implied volatility and that implied volatility comes out, all of a sudden you see a collapse. We used to call it on the floor, the volatility crush because of the volatility collapse and those premiums collapse with it. And you're able to get out of these strategies quicker, which the less amount of time you're in a strategy, the less risk you're taking in a sense, right? Um, would you do this strategy for an ETF with greater than 30? Yes, Wally, great. Uh, thank you for reminding me. With a uh, ETF, because it's a basket of goods, you guys, you know, an ETF, whether it's the Staples or, um, you know, the, uh, the gold miners or any of that, all of their volatilities average each other out and really bring that average down a little bit. So they, they meld each other out and usually ETFs will have a tough time really getting high. I mean, uh, as a matter of fact, you could look at something like, um, I was looking at Love, uh, which is Southwest Airlines and, uh, and uh, Delta Airlines. They're priced similarly, really different volatilities. Uh, um, sorry, Southwest has, High implied volatility right now, Delta has really low implied volatility, but they're in the same sector, right? So their two volatilities are really going to collapse, you know, if it were an ETF. All right. So the first one I saw was Tesla. I'm more worried about Tesla to the downside, but that's, that's my, I'm talking my position. All right. So. It's trading right around $316. Look at the bid ask, uh, should be about 30 cents wide. You know, Tesla on any given day is about that. You know, you'll see 10 cents wide. Uh, it's after the market. You can see there's a lot of volume and open interest. So it's not fitting my rule, but during day sessions, it generally does. So I'm gonna go with it for this example. Uh, so I wanna give myself a little bit of wiggle room to the downside. You could start with this right here and uh, try and build it out that way. Uh, I'd probably go $10 wide, see if I can get that. So $10, so now I wanna go, if I were to go keep it $10 wide, this would be our normal butterfly, right? I got $10 wide, $10 wide, $10 wide. Now, what do I wanna do? I want to sell this one I bought, right? This is how we do that synthetic spread in there. I wanna sell that one, gets rid of it, and then go $10 lower and buy that one. See how I did that? That's the synthetic put spread that I was talking about. You don't really see it, but that's the idea. By selling that put spread just the way I just did it, financed, quote unquote, the upside uh, gets rid of our upside risk. Now I'm getting a $2.50 credit. It's pretty darn good. You know, you can, it doesn't always have to necessarily be equal distance. It gets a little mucky. You know, if I could go down and do this one for maybe, um, you know, where I only did it for uh, a, a, like a 20 cent credit or something like that, that's up to you. I'd probably rather go with the bigger credit there because if Tesla starts rallying, then um, you'd get to keep all that, right? So that's what I would look for there. So that one works out nicely. And I will mention, puts are generally easier to set up a broken wing fly than the calls. You saw last week when we were struggling on a few of them uh, to have them. Also, I don't do this strategy uh, for earnings. If there's an earnings landing in here, uh, for instance, uh, let's just take a look at Tesla here. Uh, there's an earnings landing in here on this 35 days to expiration. I would not implement this strategy around uh, when it's there's an earnings landing in my expiration cycle, which is right here. 
Okay, so I, I would be in this strategy during this expiration cycle. I like to set up my strategy for earnings be, right before, not 10, 15 days before, because I want to get um, a clean number in a sense. And I talk about that in my uh, earnings webinars. So uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail there, but just know you want a clean month of no earnings before imp implementing this strategy. Otherwise, you're really going to be increasing your risk because earnings, you know, they can go anywhere. And we're trying to get really close to nailing the number. And it's pretty hard to nail the number on an earnings. So I'd stay away from that, right? Um, but for purposes of this uh, webinar, I'm going to just assume there's no earnings in any of the examples we're looking at for high implied volatility, because I can show you there is not a whole lot uh, with high implied volatility um, that doesn't have earnings, right? Even Deer has earnings landing right, uh, right here, last day of the earnings cycle. So they all pretty much do, but I wanna be able to give you guys some good examples. When there's not earnings, there's still a, pod, uh, a high probability, or, or uh, there is still a good chance, I should say, that you will have an opportunity to have high implied volatility when there's no earnings, okay? That, that's a fact. Not always the case, but it will happen. All right, the next one I saw was uh, Boeing. Now, we, want, we would love to see Boeing do something like this where it had high implied volatility, right? No earnings, and, then the, uh, and it traded in a nice range or even like right here, you know, it had high implied volatility. That volatility is coming out, but staying in a range. That's the perfect scenario for this, all right? High implied volatility coming out, range bound. Uh, we could say, you know, because this isn't showing any earnings over here, but there's no earnings in Boeing. Well, there, there probably is. Um, so let's delete this one and look at uh, Boeing. It's 45, you know, it's, it, it's a little low. It's up to you. For, for me, I'd probably walk away from it, but uh, it's up to you. It's close enough, you know, close, close only counts in a horseshoe, sand grenades in track two or options. Um, so uh, we are looking at a $345 stock, right? So this is the closest to the, the money, I would think. The other thing we have to look at is move the decimal place, three ticks to the left, 35 cents wide. These are inside of that 35 cent wide rule, okay? Um, and I'm gonna buy the at the money. So I'm gonna buy this one. And then I'm going to go about $10 down sell that one twice and then go ten dollars down you buy that one right that's the butterfly now i'm going to sell this one so i sell that one and then buy the one that's uh ten dollars further down that one all right that's the broken wing sold that synthetic got my credit uh eliminates my risk to the upside with boeing okay so we can look at this on the analyze tab too um Go over to the analyze the trade and uh, there you go. To the upside, no risk. It's above the zero line. Downside, we do have risk still. Uh, one thing I wanna show you here, let's look at what happens when volatility, <clears throat> what happens when volatility goes down. So if we started seeing volatility go down, see that purple line? <coughs> that means it's our, oops, I started going down the other way. When volatility starts going down, you can see all of a sudden that purple line starts going a little bit higher. All that means, and this little line starts moving in, that means we are achieving profitability faster, okay? That's why we don't want volatility to increase because it would be harder for us to achieve that. So that purple line kind of tells you what happens with your uh, potential when the volatility is adjusted okay and i see a couple questions coming up so let me try and get to those real quick oh, um is the put broken wing butterfly spread the same as a put ratio spread no there's a ratio spread uh, a put ratio spread we on the floor used to call that a christmas tree so herman if you like the um the ratio spread go check out uh christmas trees 
uh, at ProTrader Strategies because that's that's what we used to call them on the floor. And I go into explaining why we call it a Christmas tree on the floor too and all that stuff. Um, which is the new, uh, which of the neutral strategies, iron condor, the calendar spread, or the iron fly and the broken wing fly have the highest probability of success? Guess the lowest reward. Thanks. You're dead on, Wally. As a matter of fact, so which one has lowest reward? The iron condor. So the iron condor probably had the highest probability of success. So in that, if you were banging around with this and trying to get like a 50 cent credit and stuff like that, and it wasn't working out. You, were, you just kept getting a debit and you're like, apply volatility percent is like 70 right now. It's at the highest level. I got to do something. Um, look at the iron condor if it's not working out. Okay. Or you could look at the iron uh, butterfly as well. Okay. Does that make sense? All right. So a couple of things I wanted to show you with this. Uh, a couple of examples of like trying to compare apples to apples in a sense. We were talking about ETFs. Now, stocks and ETFs obviously don't um, aren't apples to apples. But in a sense, what I'm trying to do here is to show you one that has really low implied volatility. Uh, oops, I should have done that over the trade area. All right. So let's delete this one. So uh, right now, XLV has a seven implied volatility percent, super low uh, implied volatility. It's trading around $87. So let's look at what the butterfly would look like here. So with, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, with this one, we're gonna kind of go for the 87 strike. That's probably the closest to at the money, slightly out of the money. Uh, you can look at the in the monies too. Um, is, but I'm gonna look at this one buy that one. I'm going to skip $2 to go down, sell two of those, and then skip $4 to buy that one. Okay. I end up doing it for a debit. Really low implied volatility. Uh, you need high implied volatility to really make this thing work. Um, so $2 wide on the top one, right? We can say it was a $2 butterfly and then we broke the wing. So $2 here. So that's XLV, $87 stock. Now let's look at Philip Morris, which has generally much higher implied volatility, and it's at the higher range of volatility, right? It's 65%. Um, so this one, we did $2 wide and did it for a debit. This one, the closest to at the money, uh, let's say it's this one. So we buy that one, sell $2.50 wide. So we have to go a little wider with this one. So now I have to go $5 to the downside and do that one. and course it worked earlier today when I did it <laughs> as an example this came out as like a, a like a small credit of course now that I'm doing it anyway just rest assured it was it, we got wider which usually makes it more difficult to do this strategy but you know believe me when I was saying during the open market operations before the markets moved a little bit when I was playing around with it with these strikes I was able to come up with a credit for this, trying to compare apples to apples. You know, it's an $83 stock. The other one was a higher price stock. Usually with higher price stocks, this is easier to do also. Really low price stocks makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, but higher price stocks usually makes it easier where that XLV was a higher price stock. We had a tighter mark, uh, tighter spread and still wasn't able to achieve it. But believe me, today when I was vetting this example, I went through a bunch of examples and this one worked out for me. Um, but uh, tr rest assured, that's what happens when you see the different volatilities, okay? <clears throat> um, regardless of market conditions, if you were uh, allowed just one trade strategy for the rest of your life, which one would it be? Oh. One strategy I'd have to go with, I would have to go with the, um, I would probably go with the strangle, you know, because uh, that's a higher probability strategy than even the iron condor. But I would probably go with the, the short strangle. Yes, short strangle. Yes, short, short. If I could only do one side of the market, I would only do short options <laughs> for the rest of my life. 
Um, okay, so that's what we do. Selling that embedded one, high implied volatility, higher price stocks obviously are gonna make this a little bit easier as well. Okay, Does anybody else have any other questions real quick before I move on? All right, so here's another one somebody else threw out earlier. Deer, um, and uh, I do have, not in my margin account, but in my IRA, I do have deer stock uh, or a deer position. Um, and I'm not trying to limit off the cliff. This uh, is just working out well. So 140, it's 100, trading 140. We got uh, 61 implied volatility percent. So we're going right down our list, right? Environment. Uh, the underlying, I should have said next, uh, the environment's good. The underlying three ticks to the left, 14 cents wide, fits that rule inside of 14 cents wide. We're good there. Uh, EUD duration, we're looking at the 35 days to expiration um, and the environment, high implied volatility. Okay, so we're good. We're good on all those. This fits the rule. 140 is the closest to that, the money. I'm going to buy this one sell 235s and then skip the 30s to buy the uh, 25s and we get a seven cent credit. Okay. And one thing wanky about this butterfly because it knows we're trying to do a long butterfly, it's given us green and then it gives us the negative credit. Just know it's a credit. All right. If you see it saying a credit down there, you're getting a credit. All right. All right. So, uh, we're looking at that. Some the neg, all that stuff kind of gets wanky when you do the broken wings on these. I don't know why, um, but that works out for this one as well. All right, all right. Uh, in the Philip Morris spread, why do you choose to not uh, not the high open interest for the body, um, Herman? That's a great question. But let's go look at it. I don't usually look at that open interest, but you know, you brought it up. I'll, I'll take a look at it. I'm willing to learn. Um, so you're talking about these for the body here, having that room to the downside. So you buy this one, sell this one twice, and then skip this one and buy that one. Is that what you're looking at doing? It will make it, uh, sometimes it will work out that way. I don't have a problem if you, if you want to do that that way. I don't usually trade it that way, but I, I understand the value in that for sure. I definitely understand the value in that, you know, especially if you're worried about, you know, big money pushing it around. I usually will set this up like around, um, you know, I would love to do this somewhere around the point of control, right? Where my theory or Stoudemire's theory on volume profile uh, is that, you know, once it gets in this area, it gets really comfortable because nobody's making money and nobody's losing money. Therefore, there's no panic. So it's just complacency. When you get to the extremes, that's when the people that are short are hurt or the longs are hurt. And then there's get, you get that volatility smacking around. We want this to kind of come back to where the point of control is something like this, and then just settle down, you know, where it settles down coming into it, like right here. It's right here at the point of control and it just kind of slows down and we're good. Eliminate our risk to the upside, but we're good. Uh, money will trade the open interest sometimes, uh, you know, and I, I don't usually look at it. I just, um, I, I get that it can get pushed there and I'm aware of it, but I don't usually trade around that specific strategy. Uh, since you're starting uh, at the money and you're not as concerned with the delta when you're picking the wings, I'm not. I'm I'm more concerned with the you know when I'm setting this up. To be quite honest, I know that I am. Uh, I know what my deltas are, right? Because I have to go down to get to my short strike. I have to go down. I I am I'm going to be negative delta. You know, anytime you're setting that up like that, I know I'm negative delta. I need to get to my max profit, it to go down a little. 
which is something maybe a newer trader won't know. And I appreciate you, JQ, for bringing that up. And Herman, I mean, those are all great things, but uh, great aspects to trading. Um, and you can implement that in and around your strategy. Just make sure you are, you know, just like when you read online, they're going to tell you to do an in-the-money one. I don't do the in-the-money ones on the broken wing. I go just to this one. And if, if Herman, you like to set it up or anybody else likes to set up around those <laughs> uh, big volume numbers, then absolutely, you can try and do that. Just write it down and keep track of everything because the, when you're looking at it, over time and you look back on it, you'll be able to have the data to support your theory. Okay. Okay, Herman, does that make sense? All right. Um, all right, Macy can be a good example for your broken wing butterfly. We can look at Macy's. Let's look at Macy's real quick. Um, although not high percentage can give it good. Let's look at it real quick. Um, so 48, you know, that's one of those things, you know, we, we've had seriously a high implied volatility. And another thing is I have a friend that uh, looks at it like six months back and stuff. But, you know, 48 is pretty close for government work. If you really love this one and you were like volatility is still going to come out, it's going to stay right here. And all of those other things are green lights, let's say, all of the other things. And then you're like. Oh, but Wolfman said it's got to be above 50 and it's only 48. Well, I'm not going to go to something else. Well, not necessarily. Just know that it's a yellow light. Just be careful with it. All right. Stay, stay on it. All right. So Macy's one last, I'll do one last example here. So Macy's, let's look at it. It's trading 36. You know, it looks like it's getting a trend. It looks like there's no earnings, even though there probably is. Um, so Macy's, we can look at something like the... 36 is the closest to that, the money, I would say. So 36. And then, you know, the one thing with these lower ones, we probably have to go a little bit tighter, but I'm going to try and squeeze it out. The, the I can see it that I'm going to be able to do it. I'm doing the math in my head. So i uh, skipping $2, and then now I need to go $4 down to define my risk, and I get it for a five-set credit. So, yes, that one would work. Um out nicely, get down to the 34 strike. It's got Herman's pretty high implied volatility, uh, or uh, sorry, uh, open interest. Okay, so uh, you know that could be the wheelhouse where this market wants to go. So you could be right around there. You could even, uh, you know, tighten it up a little bit if you wanted. Okay, so that one works out nicely as well. No, it's a bit off talk. However, really appreciate your help. Oh, thanks, William. I appreciate that. Uh, short strangle in an IRA, 45 days to expiration, 10 to 15 deltas, 50% max profit or 100% loss. Um, does that strategy sound reasonable to you? Yes. That's kind of the way I do it. Oh, and buy a, uh, buy a call for five cents in the same days to expiration and then cash secured put. I'll have to uh, reach out to me on uh, on email. I don't have enough bandwidth right now, William, trying to keep everything together to, uh, to uh, put that through my head right now. All right. Uh, well, you're not naked call in this one. We're defined risk because, you know, you have a short call, but, you know, I mean, even if it goes into the money and stuff like that, you're defined risk by these, or sorry, puts. Uh, you, you don't have the, oh, you're talking about with your strategy. I See, like I'm confusing myself. I, I can't get off right now. Come back to me on that, William. I'd love to like put my wrap my head around it, but I, I won't be able to do that right now, unfortunately. Um, all right. So that's about it. Other than earnings are right around the corner. I talked about this earlier. Hard to set this strategy up tomorrow uh, with all the earnings and everything else coming out very shortly but get ahead of this this is like eight hours of earnings strategies uh all all of the different strategies that i use for earnings and my rules in and around specifically to earnings okay uh so all of those for 36 bucks you could 
probably pay that off coming up in this next earnings season easily. And then you have it for free forever, right? Uh, anyway, wouldn't you guys say that you would be better off if you had higher probabilities of success? I mean, that's how Vegas got it done. They knew that every probability was in their favor. And look at Vegas. They bought a lot of light bulbs with your money, right? So if you've enjoyed my instruction, especially if you guys are one of my regulars, uh, you guys really need to sign up for this course for 36 bucks. And with earnings right around the corner, um, I can I can help you get through that hurdle of not wanting to trade options. You know, that's my favorite time to trade is during option season. I think it's the best. That's when um, I generally uh, make most of my money. But um, anyway, the best way to become a better trader is to constantly learn, which you guys have clearly done that uh, already by attending this particular webinar anyway. And when you say that it would be uh, just knowing how to create this option strategy by like your option strategies by Google <laughs> or trading technical analysis isn't enough to create consistent winners. I mean, what I mean to say is that trading the technicals or just building a strategy isn't the best way to get ahead in this game. All right. The best way to get ahead in this game is to increase your probabilities of success and become more mechanical and Anyone can teach you how to build a strategy. You can even figure it out online, like I said. But nope, there aren't people out there teaching you specifically strike location, volatility, and all of those things, and how we stay mechanical and increase our probability of, of success even further in our favor. All right. So when you're using the right tools in the right situation, you guys are going to be more productive state of mind, be able to put on more strategy. Uh, more strategies, which creates more opportunities. And that will ultimately build your confidence and you will be able to consistently create more consistent winners. All right. So, oh, sorry, guys, the link is in the chat window. We've been going back and forth in the questions window. I put this link right here in the chat window. You can click on that. It sends you right there. Otherwise, if you're watching this on tape delay, I'm sorry, you guys are going to have to pause it and punch this into your URL. But yes, you get somewhere between eight and 10 hours of options, earnings, strategies. All right. Uh, want to thank you guys all. Later webinars, I'm going to be dealing, drilling down on different option components, trades I find and where I find them appropriate. There's a link right here again. Again, it's not a hot link. You're going to have to type it into the URL by pausing. But I'm going to thank you guys all for watching. If you have any questions, Reach out to us at 310-598-6677 or email us at protraderstrategies.com. All right. Trading at protraderstrategies.com. Uh, webinar appreciated. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it, Patricia. Understanding is slowly improving. Yes, Patricia, we're on the right track. Thanks, Herman. Appreciate it, Wally. All right. Yeah, here's the link and um, or here's the offer, but the link is in the window. All right. That's it for today, you guys. Other than if you can't take that, take it easy. I missed you the last couple of weeks, JQ. <laughs> Keeping my eye.